Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, we open to Romans chapter 8 this morning. You might have noticed that I am up here again preaching for the third week in a row. Some of you are wondering, when is it going to be Pastor Terry's time? And these are like the never-ending verses I was assigned, and so it was supposed to be one week, and then it turned into two weeks, and now it's three weeks of verses 28, 29, and 30. Last week, we worked through 29 and 30, or we began to, often referred to as the golden chain of salvation. This is because each item in the text always leads to the next, finally to glorification. Each link in the chain is an unbreakable part of the chain because it is accomplished by God himself. As we begin, I want to give a couple of refreshers from last week. We saw a couple of observations I want to touch base on. Observation number one, the order matters. The order that we're given in verses 29 and 30 are the order in which they occur in our life. Observation number two, one state always leads to the next. There will never be any left undone. That is because God is the one accomplishing this in you, and he's leading you to that next state. Observation number three, God is the one who ensures that each happens. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he began that work in us, and he promises us that he will carry on that work until the final completion. The same promise in Philippians 1.6 we see demonstrated and played out in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Some of you might have noticed I spent a significant amount of time last week on a single word, and that word was for new. That's because it's that word that's often misrepresented or skewed, and just like in flying, if you're off one degree at your starting point, by the time you end up where you're trying to go, you're going to be potentially thousands of miles off course if you have the wrong starting point. And so for new, we must understand as what it was meant in the text. For those whom God intimately set his affection upon beforehand, he also predestined. If you missed that sermon, I encourage you to go watch it. It's going to be foundational as we continue on. So once again, the order of events in our verses follow this flow. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. So this leads us to verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also Called. That's going to be the word we're working through this morning or start working. Uh, this word called, we often theologically refer to as an effectual call. Not effectual with an A, but effectual with an E. The effectual call is God's sovereign drawing of a sinner to salvation done in power and authority. It will have an effect on the man or woman that God is calling. When God calls somebody, he always gets his man or he always gets his woman. Isaiah 55, 11 says this, So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. What we see here is that when God's word is proclaimed, when God's word is preached, it will not return void. It will accomplish what God has intended for it to accomplish in the life of a believer as well as in the life of an unbeliever. It is the word of God that changes hearts and changes minds. It's not our intellectual capabilities. It's not our skills of debating. It is God's word through his spirit that changes hearts and minds. The word of God either softens hearts leading to repentance or it hardens hearts leading to a continual sinning, rebellion to God. But God promises us it will succeed in whatever purpose it sets forth. Something else for us to note about this aspect of being called is that this is really the first step we can observe in somebody else. We can't see who God foreknew. We can't see who God predestined, but those whom he did foreknow and those whom he did predestine, he calls. And this is the first step we can really observe in these steps. 
So I want to ask us, what does an effectual calling look like? Well, if you're in Christ, you were effectually called at one point in your life. You know your salvation story. I know many of your salvation stories of how God pursued you and called you to himself. I want to go through in the scriptures a few examples of effectual calls that we see here throughout the scriptures. The first clearest example we could come up with was the conversion of Saul. Saul was persecuting the church, hating Christians, murdering those who followed after Jesus. And in an instant, we see Saul fall on his knees and submit himself to Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask us, what happened in that moment, on that road? Is it because Saul all of a sudden realized some prophecies about Jesus? Is it because he thought of some Old Testament passages in the right way all of a sudden? Was it because he heard something new that he had never heard before? No, it's not any of these things. It's not that he just suddenly realized the gospel. No, his name was called by the Lord. He was effectually called. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul had his name called by the Lord, and he responded in submitting himself to the Lord. Now, we don't see the Lord asking Saul, Saul, you're a really talented guy. You know, you know Saul, I'm, I'm putting together a team of people, and I could really use a guy with your character. I could really use a guy with your religious background. I could really use a guy with your type of knowledge and talents. For the Marvel fans in the audience, I don't know if there are any Marvel fans in the audience. How many of you have seen the Avengers movie? Let's, let's do a show of hands. Okay, there's a lot of people who saw the Avengers movie. This won't be lost on everybody. Nick Fury said in the first Avengers movie, as he was putting together the team of superheroes, he says this, the idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people. See if they could become something more. See if they could work together when we needed them to, to fight the battles we never could. Is this how we think God calls people? That he goes to them and he calls them to himself because he's putting together a team to win this world over. That he goes to Saul and he says, Saul, I'm putting together a remarkable team. I need someone of your quality and character and I'm gonna use you to write some scriptures. Is this what God does? Is this just a general call that people can respond to if they choose to or not? That would be a call without power or authority. That is not an effectual call. Throughout scripture, every time the Lord chooses to reveal himself to someone in power and authority, every time they fall on their knees before the Lord in repentance and submission. Never once does someone stand tall when God reveals himself and says, not today, Lord, O oh, creator of heavens and earth. I, I'm not submitting to you today, maybe some other time. I have things I want to accomplish, places I want to go. Never once. In Acts chapter 9, after Paul was called and born again, we read this. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. That didn't take long, did it? Now he's praying to the Lord, right? And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he can regain his sight. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, listen to this part, go for he is a chosen instrument of mind to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Did you catch that last part? The Lord says, go to Saul. And why is that? Because he says, listen, go to Saul because I have chosen him. He is a chosen instrument of mine, and I have set forth purposes for him to accomplish. He is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. He's going to stand before kings and the children of Israel. To believe that Saul 
in this moment had to open the door of his heart to let God in would believe, to believe that Saul could have said no to the Lord at this time? Do we believe that Saul could have said, not today, Lord. I know you've chosen me, but not today. Can you imagine a scenario? God scratching his head, thinking to himself, do you know how many strings I've pulled to get you into the best Jewish colleges to study under the best rabbis and all of these things? And then you told me no. And typically people jump back to that word for new and say, well, God knew that Saul was going to say yes in his foreknowledge. So did God start planning all of these things out because of that knowledge to get him to that place? I mean, which comes first? The, the yes that God had to look ahead to see and then he starts planning people's lives? That's not the kind of, that's not the kind of God we see in the scriptures. It's not that God says, oh, I guess I need to find a different guy. Because Saul told me no. No, we don't believe that because we believe in a God that when he calls, people come. I want to give some more evidence of God's effectual calling that we see in the scriptures, one of which would be Galatians chapter 1. This again is of Paul declaring to the church of Galatia. He says, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my own people, So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. Now listen to this. He's going to tie in four new predestined and called. He's about to tie it all together. He says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born. What does it mean to be set apart before you were born? That means you were affectionately chosen. You were foreknown. He set him apart before he was born and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. We see Paul confirming everything we see in Romans chapter eight. Saul says he was set apart before he was born. He was foreknown. He was predestined to do this work by the Lord. Then we read in verse 15, he was called by the Lord's grace. And notice it was done in the timing and manner according to the Lord's pleasure. According to the Lord's pleasure, the when, the where, and the how of when Saul came to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when we tie all this back, when we we look at Romans 8, 28, and we see in Romans 8, 28 about how God promising that all things work together for good for those who have been called according to his purposes. But then we go to Acts chapter 7, we see the stoning of Stephen. And we see here in Acts chapter 7, verse 58, that they take Stephen, who's proclaiming the gospel, they drag him out of the city to stone him, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. But we just read in Galatians that God had set apart to come and reveal himself in his perfect timing to Saul. We could ask the question, we see Saul at the stoning of Stephen, at a minimum, the executioners of Stephen trusted Saul. They put their possessions at Saul's feet to watch over them so they could freely stone Stephen. We could ask, how come God didn't reveal himself to Saul before the stoning of Stephen? Couldn't God have saved Stephen's life? How come he didn't save Saul earlier in life as a young child? And the answer, according to Paul himself, in Galatians 1, is he was set apart before he was born. He was called according to the grace of God and that Jesus was revealed to Saul when it pleased him most. And it pleased him most to reveal the gospel in Jesus Christ to Saul after the stoning of Stephen. Another example of what it looks like to be called, we see with the conversion of a woman named Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Now, the conversion of Lydia is one of the clearest examples we have in Scripture of a conversion taking place. We see the inner workings of conversion in Lydia. It's one of the clearest examples that we have. If you turn over to Acts chapter 16, we see it in verses 13 through 15. We see this is Paul after he's been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, he's now proclaiming this gospel. It says, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. 
One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul after she was baptized in her household as well. Notice here, we see inner workings happening by God himself. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said. Notice there were others there. They were sharing the gospel with many others, and we don't hear the Lord open their heart, but he did open Lydia's heart, and the people who he opened their heart, what happened to them? They came to know Christ as Lord. Why did God have to open her heart? Could he not have opened her heart? We see here that he did open her heart, and as a result, she came to faith in Jesus Christ. We're given this picture. Some of you might be thinking, well, well, this word called, when we're calling upon the Lord or the Lord is calling us, what, is, what about the Bible verses that talk about us calling on the name of the Lord? Does this work together? Or maybe God's calling is our calling. What about scriptures like that? For example, Joel chapter 2, verse 32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we think, see, Scripture says, if you call on the name of the Lord, that's how you get salvation. Acts chapter 2, verse 21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 22, verse 16, and now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. In all of these passages, I want you to notice that the people, we are the ones calling on the name of the Lord. But this is not what we read in Romans 8.30. In 8.30, we read the Lord calling those who have been predestined. And those who have been predestined have been foreknew or foreknown because God intimately set his affection upon them, choosing by his own grace. So I want to connect the dots together of God's effectually calling us and our calling the Lord to save us. How do these two things work together. Here's a summary point. Our calling on the Lord to save us is a response to his calling our name to come to him. That's how these two work together. He calls our name. He calls out Saul. He calls out your name. And as a result of him calling with an effectual power and authority, your name, we respond by calling on the Lord to save us. We see in scripture that people don't call upon the Lord to be saved unless they have first been called. John chapter six, verse 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them. So no one here actually means what church? No one. So no one gets to Jesus unless who calls them first? The father, right? The father draws them. John 6, 37, all that the father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes, I will never cast out. So we see these scriptures of how they work together. So you don't get there unless you've been called. And those who have been called, Jesus says, they will what? Go. They will come. So our professing and calling on the name of the Lord to save us is always a response to his calling us to himself. Jesus said it this way. If anyone has an ear to hear, come to me. He stands and proclaims the gospel and he says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and I will give you living water. If anyone is hungry, if any of you have a hunger, come to me and I will give you food that satisfies. Now, some people came because they were thirsty. Some people came because they heard something others didn't. Some people came because they had a hunger that other people did not have. I want you to notice this gospel invitation was an invitation for everyone to come. It wasn't just a select invitation. It was an invitation for everyone to come, but only those who had the ears to hear or the eyes to see could come. Why did some come and others would not? Because some had a foreign hunger. Some had a foreign thirst that others did not have? Why were some willing to repent of their sins, to give up the very sins the scriptures say we loved? 
How could we do such a thing? Scripture teaches that everyone today who has been born has been born in Adam. We all have a sin nature. We all love the sins of this world. We love to please ourselves, to live for ourselves. And we see a picture in Scripture that my flesh wants nothing to do with God. And if God decided to let me go my own way, that doesn't make him evil. This is where people get confused. They think if God doesn't do something that he's evil, when in reality, scripture says, no, all of us are evil. And if God chose to do nothing that doesn't make him evil, it still makes us evil because we are pursuing our sin. God allowing people to go their own way does not make God evil. All the time, people hear the gospel, and they don't want anything to do with it. And God would be completely just if he allowed me to go my own way, as I wanted nothing to do with him. And that way would continue on until I die, and I would be pursuing hell. It's not God sending me there. It's me running there because that's where I want to go. I want nothing to do with the Lord. But we're given some great news in scripture, that God in his great mercy has decided that he will not allow everyone to go their own way. This is by overriding your desires. Your desires, my desires, was hellbound towards sin, and God has decided that he won't allow us to go the way we all want to go. God in his great mercy has decided he will not allow everyone to go the way they want to go. And so if you've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ this morning, you can know you have been given salvation because God was not willing to allow you to go the way you wanted to go. It's not God's fault people run after their sin. Scripture teaches people are responsible and will be held responsible for their sin. But for some, God demonstrated his love for us in this that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. R.C. Sproul says it this way, God doesn't just throw us a life preserver to a drowning person. He goes to the bottom of the sea, pulls a corpse from the bottom of the sea, takes him up on the bank, breathes into him the breath of life, and makes him alive. This is what it means to be called John chapter 10, verses 27 and 30, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Jesus is teaching about this concept through the gospel of John, this, those who have been foreknown. He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. Here's this calling, right? He calls them by name. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. This is a picture of what it means to be called by the Holy Spirit. This knowing is compared to those whom he foreknew. Jesus knows them and they know him. Therefore, when he calls their name, they say, that's my shepherd. And they immediately respond. We see here in John that those who come to Christ are those who have been given to Jesus by the Father. So if you've turned and trusted in Jesus Christ this morning as Lord and Savior, you can be encouraged that you are in the palm of Jesus' hand. And he has promised to the Father that he will not lose a single one in his hand that have been given from the Father. And all that have been given from the Father will come. And Jesus says, all that have come, I will not lose a single one. One, this is why we believe that a true believer in Christ cannot lose their salvation because you're not the one who's maintaining your salvation. You're not the one who received your salvation by your own works. It's by his calling. Therefore, he's the one who's maintaining this. He says, I give them eternal life. They don't earn it. He says, I give it and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hands. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. I would say he's greater than you. He's greater than me. Therefore, I can't even remove myself from his hand. If he has truly called me, I am his. 
I'm not my own anymore. It says he owns me. It says he has given them to me. He's greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. I want you to know and treasure and hold on to this truth that even at times when we lose our grip on him, that he is the one who's holding us. He is the one maintaining us. This is why your salvation cannot be lost because you are not the one who started it. You're not the one who's maintaining it. You aren't the one who's going to bring it to completion. He is. He did that. He's the one who has us. It's not due to anything I brought to the table. Scripture says I was at my worst when he called me. I don't have a fear of being kicked off God's team because I'm on God's team, not because of anything I brought to the team. It's not my skills and abilities that keeps me there. It's not as long as I keep performing, God's gonna keep me on his team. It's I was at my worst, an enemy in rebellion to God, and he calls me to himself. I couldn't be any worse than I was. You couldn't be any worse than you were. Therefore, we have complete assurance that the God who calls us is the God who will keep us because he who began a good work in you will finish that work. Isaiah 43, verse one. Thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are are mine. I want you to see this picture. Those whom the Lord calls, he says, are his possession. He says, I have called you, you are mine. Christ calling leads to his possession. And those who are in his possession, he says, you are mine and no one will take you out of my hand. That's because he's in control of this. We move on to this next action, this next portion in this golden chain of salvation of justified. It says, those whom he called, he also justified. I think out of all the five terms, this justification is the one we're probably most familiar with. It's the one that's most often preached upon. That those who come to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith, that is through his calling, the next scriptures teach upon is that we will be justified. Justification is the action of declaring or making something righteous in the sight of God. It is at this point through the blood of Jesus Christ and our repentance and our faith in him that we are made whole and righteous before God. We are justified in the sight of God because of the life, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His blood satisfied the wrath of God towards my sin. Therefore, I have been made right with God. But I want us to see that our justification and right standing with God is fourth in line to some other things that have happened. It doesn't stand alone. Sometimes we think until they're justified and we just try to get people justified, not realizing there's a whole bunch of other steps that have taken place before that point. It does not stand alone. It is only after a long progression of other works, foreknown, predestined, called, justified. God is done before the point leading to our salvation. Justification happens in the moment of salvation. This is where you are declared righteous and clean. It is a one-time done deal for the believer. Lastly, we come to our last word in our golden chain of events done so by the Lord, and that is glorified. What does it mean when it says he glorified? Often we could call this glorification. This is the end goal of the process that God began. Glorification is the end goal that will result in sons and daughters being Christ-like. Many times Christians ask the question, well, how does sanctification fit in this list of five things? Because we see foreknown, and then we see predestined, called, and then we see justified, and then glorified. And we think, well, what about sanctification? Sanctification is something we talk about all the time in church, growing. It's the process a Christian grows through in becoming more Christ-like through their thoughts, words, actions, and motives. So how does sanctification fit in with this list of five? It was asked to me at the end of last week's message, 
why isn't sanctification in this list? And it's a great question. It's one that I had a question with as well. And the answer is that sanctification is already built in to this fifth item, glorification. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, We all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Notice it says, we are being transformed, present tense, right now, from one degree of glory to the next. The process of glorification has begun today for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Pastor Douglas Wilson said it this way, I shared this a few weeks ago. In one sense, heaven and hell have the same definition. They are both places where you become what you have been becoming. Those whom he justified through the blood of Christ, he glorified. So if you're here this morning, you've been born again, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, your sins have been forgiven, you can know that God has begun the process of glorification in you. It is not yet completed. It will be completed one day, but he is leading you from one stage of glory to the next. He began that work in you the same very day you came to know Christ as Savior. He began a work of glorification. I want to tie this in from verse 28 from two weeks ago. It says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We saw in verse 28, the promise that God will work all things together for good and how his purpose is to conform those who have been called to the image of Jesus Christ. One of the purposes is to make us like himself. We will be and are being glorified to become more like the Son. I've said it already, but it's worth saying again. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I have a question for us this morning. I think I'll have a lot of participation with this question, a lot of show of hands. How many of you have a problem sometimes with starting projects and not finishing them all the way through? Let's raise our hands. Okay, we can be honest. All right, so what about starting a project, finishing the project, but not fully cleaning up everything, putting it back where it goes. Go ahead and raise your hand for, for that one, okay? Because that's part of the project, right? Sometimes I do the project, I finish the project, but I leave some tools out because I'm just so tired that I got done with the project. And my wife says, the, the project's still not done, right? We're in agreement with that, right? So the project's not done unless it's completely cleaned up. I was just going to focus on changing the oil or fixing that doorknob or whatever it is, but you have to put every single tool away. Well, isn't it encouraging to know that with God, that never happens? God never bites off more than he can chew. He never gets into a project or a remodel and realizes that there was more work to be done. I just met with someone this week, they're a contractor and they were remodeling their house and they started this remodel. And because they started this remodel, they found out through the process later that their house is not up to code according to the flood zone. And because they started this remodel, their whole house now has to be lifted up a certain amount of height. Now, if they just would have kept it that way, it was fine. But because they got into this remodel and tore things down, now you have to build it back up to code. Talk about a nightmare, right? And so they got into a project thinking it was going to be this big. It turned into this huge project, and now it's overwhelming. Right now, we have a ton of projects going on in our home, some by choice, others not so much. And there are times where I know there's more to do. I know there's things to clean up, but I just don't feel I have the energy or motivation to finish the project. So I'd rather just go and sit and do something I want to do and block that area out. You know how to do that? Some of you know how to do that. You just kind of ignore that area. It doesn't even exist in your mind. 
So for example, my wife has done an incredible job of transforming our back patio into a relaxing sitting area. It, it looks so nice out there, except for my shovel, my rake, and some other tools I left there yesterday because I didn't finish the job I was working on. That's confession. I need to go home and fix that. But to go and sit on the back porch, read a book, have an iced coffee, maybe a little piece of dark chocolate, ignore that my garage is a complete disaster, ignore that our bathroom remodeled, there's only a toilet in there right now. I could ignore these other things and just sit and look at our back porch and how nice it is. I want, to, I want us to know God is not like that with us. He, he's not so tired of your mess and your lack of sanctification or where you're at. He's not frustrated to where he's just gonna leave you in your room and go sit with somebody else whose room is a little bit more put together. Sometimes we escape the chaos over here and I just wanna go sit in this area of the home or this area of life or with this person that has things put together because the other areas are so draining. I want you to know, God doesn't try to escape the chaos of your life to go spend time with other people. He doesn't do that. He is working in and through the chaos of your life. He doesn't begin a project and realize there's more to do. The final culmination of all of this efforts is that one day we will stand complete in him. We will be like him because of the work he has done in us and through us. He uses our trials and our tribulations. He uses his church. He uses his people. He uses his word. He uses his preaching. He uses family and friends. He uses difficulties. He uses your marriage. He uses your children. He uses your workplace, your employees, your employers. If you've been saved by the blood of Christ this morning, I want you to know he is currently, right now, in the process of leading you from one stage of glory to the next. That is his work he's doing in you, and he will finish that work. That is the promise that we're given, that he began it, he's working on it, and we have a promise he will finish it. I want you to know he has called us by name. Therefore, you are his possession. And he is molding and crafting us from one degree of glory to the next. Would you pray with me as we give the Lord praise? God, we thank you for these promises. What lofty promises these are. We can so easily be discouraged where we know how we should be, we know what we should say, how we should act, and that we don't measure up. We thank you that your saving us was in response to your grace and mercy. God, we acknowledge that you in your mercy have sought us and pursued us and called us by name, not because we were worth it, worthy of that calling, but because you are a holy God. That you have, through your grace, chosen that you will not allow us to go our own way. And we thank you for that. God, we thank you that you don't run away from us because of the chaos in our life or the areas that we seem to always take a step backwards in or when we lose our temper or we blow up or say things we shouldn't or think on things we shouldn't, but that you are working in all of these things to bring us from one degree of glory to the next. God, help us to hold these promises in our minds and our hearts, knowing that you have us in the palm of your hand, that you have called us by name, and those whom you call it says you will never lose one. That when you call, that we are your treasured possession. God, I know often we don't feel like a treasured possession. But you have declared that we are, and it's because of the great work you are working in us and through us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we cling to your word and to these promises. We come to you and worship again. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.